Welcome to another episode of Digging Deeper. We're glad that you've joined us. Uh, what we aim to do in these podcasts that are a part of Perimeter Church and our ministries here is that we want to do just what the title says. We want to dig deeper into important topics and not just dig dip deeper into them, but uh, shape them in such a way to where it helps us embrace uh, the Christian worldview, biblical basis, and the viewpoint from the kingdom of God and how we can uh, understand complex issues, oftentimes even within our culture. So today, as we consider that, we are dealing with the uh, very, very um, hotly debated, emotionally charged, uh, complex issue of sexuality uh, in the world today and in our culture and all around us. And so we've brought in um, a dear, dear friend and, and partner in ministry, um, Dr. Nancy Piercy, we are grateful for you. We are so uh, happy that you've taken time to not only be on this podcast with me today, but to be with our staff. Uh, we're recording this on a Tuesday afternoon around 2.30 p.m., and she has spent um, since 9, it was like 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. with our staff talking almost nonstop. And so, uh, and then you're doing an event for us tonight at the church. Uh, that will also require you to give a lot. So uh, I know you're going to be exhausted when you get home tonight. And so thank you for joining us and, and making time for us and being a blessing. It's good to have you. Thanks so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, let's jump in. Uh, where we're wanting to go in this conversation, as we think about God's design for sexuality, and we think about uh, how the uh, those who would not be in a biblical framework or within a Christian worldview, how, how those individuals and, and folks approach sexuality, there's, there's great distance between those two, right? And there's great uh, disagreement between how people approach this whole topic. You've written a book, you've written several mm -hmm. books, but you've written a book that we've been talking a lot about here and that we've recommended to our church, Love Thy Body, and in it, uh, you say some things that we have found to be incredibly helpful, insightful, and instructive for us. And uh, let's start with where you start in the introduction, if that's okay. You, know, you start off at the very beginning of the first, first sentence in the introduction of the book is that human life and sexuality have become the watershed moral issues of our age that might have been debatable or arguable at some level 20, 30 years ago, but it's not anymore. I mean, we all feel it. We see it. We experience it. And one of the ways that I, I've appreciated so much is that you come behind that right here in the introduction of the book and you lay out a, a way of thinking about helping to decipher truth and the even the split nature of truth that we now see all around us. And a lot of that is shaped by Francis Schaeffer, who some who are listening may recognize that name. But I'd love for you to explain that. So I guess here's the question. Uh, in Love Thy Body, it's helpful that you simplify it to upper and lower, the upper and lower story. And so for those who haven't read the book or have trouble maybe even grasping what that's talking about, let's clarify that. What do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, it's a metaphor of two stories in a building. And you're right. It was Francis Schaeffer who really um, popularized that image in the Christian world. And he was referring primarily to the concept of truth. His point was that the uh, Christians need to understand that the concept of truth has changed. Mm -hmm. It's split in half. Um, it used to be, well, virtually every civilization has thought that there's a natural order and that there's a moral slash spiritual order, but that they were both part of the same cosmos. You know, there was a single integrated cosmos, and therefore truth would be a single integrated whole. And we had that in the, st in the, in the Western culture until the rise of modern science. Mm. And with science, there are many people began to say, no, 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 there's the only truth, the only reliable knowledge we have is of the physical realm, empirical facts, what we know by science. Right. Well, what does that do then to things that cannot be known, you know, directly by empirical methods, you know, that can't be tough, uh, stuffed into a test tube and studied under a microscope? Right. Well, many people began to say, well, those aren't really truths. Those are just your personal, private, subjective experiences and feelings. And... Schaefer's point was 
that this is the main barrier to communicating Christian truth in our age. Because mm. if you say Christianity is true, the concept of truth is no longer the same. And mm. so, and that's why it was it was a very helpful message. But what I discovered in going on to other subject areas, like in, in this book, dealing with moral issues like abortion, euthanasia, homosexuality, transgenderism, and so on, is that if the concept of truth is split, it turns out it affects everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it turns out that many um, ethicists, bioethicists, will talk about the body versus the person. Yeah. Which ends up being essentially the same, you know, metaphor of a uh, upper story and a lower story, in the sense that science is what we know. You know the the body, the body is what we know by science. It's yeah. it's an empirical fact. It's knowable, you know, by empirical methods. But personhood is considered, you know, in the upper story, where it's a ma matter of how, you know, how you value human life. Right. What stat? What moral status it has? What um, whether it warrants legal protection? So if you read ethicists, I'm not talking about Christian ethicists, you know, secular bioethicists usually use the language of body versus person. Mm. And they see the two as very separate. And, mm -hmm. and m the reason my book is called Love Thy Body is because I make the point that not only has a secular worldview split body from person, but it has a low view of the body. It denigrates right. the body. Right. And so as, uh, as, as a... Uh, I talk about the different issues from abortion to homosexuality and so on. I show that they're all based on a negative view, on a low view of the body. And yep. that's what's kind of unusual about the book. Because most people, you know, most people think Christians have a low view of yeah. the body. You know, that Ironically. We, yeah. we care only about the spiritual realm, right? right? And we don't, we don't care about this world or the material, or the physical realm. And so that's sort of the switch in my, the mm. surprising, you know, turning the tables, yeah. so to speak. Let me, let me. Let me make sure I'm following, and and because I'm even thinking about with some listeners, let's make sure because w one of the things that we're not able to do right now in this setting is just even see see it right to where you you literally think, okay, let's look at a a lower story and an upper story. We got a line in between them, and the lower story is going to be your fact. This is what's factual, right? To your point a, mo a moment ago, this is what you can measure. This is what you can look at under a microscope. It's biological. Mm -hmm. Second story is what you value. What do you most value? And that's going to be more in the realm of psychological, correct? Right? Is, am, I, am I right in saying that? That that would be more psychological realm, more um, what you feel, what you... Uh, help me out here. Is that right? Give yes. Me, give me more language there to help people think about what is in that second story that's outside of that biological framework. Yeah, so when, when Francis Schaeffer introduced the metaphor of two stories in a building, mm -hmm. um, what I didn't realize at the time was that secular people have been using the same metaphor. They call it the fact-value split. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you, know, you started using the language of facts and values, and values yep. because that is the way the secular world speaks about it. And, so, and that can be helpful, too, that we realize that... Um, so, so when we get to the moral issues, that's that's really where where we're interested in talking about today. Right. Um, yes. The what we know about the the, the human person in terms of the bi the biology scientifically. Uh, well, you know, it might be easier to take an example. I was about to say, take abortion, <laughs> like you did yeah. with this morning. It was really helpful. Where it kind of became concrete for me as you walk through the example of how some approach abortion from this split truth perspective. So, yes. so it, yeah. Yes, and, and that's where it was first applied to. Secular bioethicists basically said, okay, we can't deny that the fetus is human, mm. right? The, the evidence from science, from DNA is, and genetics is just too strong to deny it. Yep. So, you know, you may find ordinary people who aren't quite there yet, but if you talk to professional bioethicists, they all agree that life begins at conception. Yep. There's no doubt about it. So, but many of them are secular and they want to support abortion. So how do they get around that, mm -hmm. the science? And what they say, oh, well, the fetus is human, but it's not a person mm -hmm. until sometime later. And that's where you have that divide. And that's yeah. the divide. It's the yeah. human versus person, right? right? The body versus uh, the personhood. And so you'll find secular bioethicists who will say, 
you know, as long as the fetus is merely human, merely in quote marks here, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> merely human, it can be killed for any reason or no reason. You know, mm-hmm. it can be tinkered with genetically. It can be picked through for sellable body parts as plant par- Planned Parenthood does and then tossed out with the other medical waste. And that's Which a, is the actual term they use, medical waste. If correct? you read yeah. the f- medical journals, yes, mm-hmm. they refer to the fetus as medical waste. Mm-hmm. And so this is when I say they, they have a very low view of the body. That would be an example mm-hmm. where the, re- the way to understand the secular view of abortion is they're basically saying, yes, the fetus is human, but so what? It has no value. It has no worth. It has no significance. We only give it significance when we decide it, it, it qualifies as a person, mm-hmm. usually defined in terms of mental abilities, so, some mm-hmm. level of cognitive functioning, self-awareness, and so on. Uh, of course, the problem with that is if you separate personhood from being biologically human, how do you define personhood? Right. Where's the line? When right. does it start? Yep. Right. And when does it end? Well, uh, euthanasia, that's right? Euthanasia. We, yeah, yeah. And, and you'll find on both of these questions, the secular bioethicists, none of them agree. They all have their own view because it's become subjective and arbitrary. Mm-hmm. You know, as long, when it's separated from biological fact... It becomes subjective, relativistic, arbitrary. Mm. And so if you read their literature, you'll find that they all draw the line at somewhere, a different place. Right. And so it's ironic because in a sense, you know, Christians have been told, keep your private values out of the public realm. But now the secular view (laughs) of personhood is a private value Mm -hmm. that's completely Mm -hmm. subjective. You know, who's, and in fact, there was an, uh, there's a Yale, a Yale University professor who lit, wrote in the New York Times, uh, he, he said, the question of abortion is not really a question about life in any biological sense. It's about, and this is a direct quote, it's about the magical moment at which a f- f- mere physical mm. thing, you know, becomes a person. Mm. It's a question about the soul. Wow. That's what he wrote. Wow. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Christians are told, don't bring your religion into the public square. But mm. who's bringing their religion sure. into the public square? It's really, we need to turn the tables. The secular mm. people are bringing their private, subjective, arbitrary positions into the public square. Mm. Interesting. When you, it might be helpful um, just to even maybe define some terms here. When you say secular, mm-hmm. what what what's a... What's a simple definition of what you're getting at when you say secular and and what would be the opposite of secular? Yeah, I, I really use it primarily to mean, you know, uh, th- there's a Christian perspective, a right. Christian worldview, right. and then there are secular worldviews. And that Not would just inc- one, there's many. Th- correct? Exactly, yeah, yeah. there's many. And right. so it's nice to have sort of a comprehensive term to mean um, secular usually means some form of materialism or naturalism. You know, materialism is matter is all that exists. There's no spiritual realm. Naturalism, uh, which is actually more common today among many scientists, is nature is all that exists. Right. So na- anyth- anything non-natural, you know, mind, mind, uh, soul, spirit, God, mm. you know, none of this is real. In fact, today, the cutting edge position is that there's no such thing as free will, because, you know, free will is not something you can, uh, you know, it's not a material thing. It's not a physical thing. And in fact, today, there's, they will even argue that there's no such thing as consciousness. Mm. Because it's the, just neurons firing. Neurons right? firing in your brain. Mm. Exactly. Mm. And so that's the cutting edge position right now is, you know, you, you, it's, it's kind of um, ironic because your question would be, well, if there's no, no such thing as consciousness, Who's conscious of that fact? (laughs) (laughs) Right. And if we're not conscious, are we now not human? Right? Yeah. Am I I thinking about that correctly? Or we're not a person now, I guess, if we're not conscious. I don't know. We're getting too philosophical. Well, one of your questions, I I read ahead your questions, you talked about postmodernism. Right, yeah. And I think that's, you're you're sort of edging onto the difference between a modernist view and a postmodern view. Because the modernist, you know, if you hang out with scientists, (laughs) if you're a more scientific person, then uh, the, t- the prevailing view is we're basically bio- ke- we're complex biochemical machines. Yep. And we have no free will. We have no consciousness. 
But then you go over and talk to the postmodernists. Like if you were on a college campus, you go from the natural sciences you know, over to uh, English and mm -hmm. the humanities, mm -hmm. and they're all totally into postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's almost the opposite. It's like science is just a human construction. It's just a social construction. It's just humans coming up with these ideas. So mm -hmm. why, why should we value science? Everything's just a social construction. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of... Uh, when when Schaefer said the modern mindset is split, it's more split than it was when he was writing. That's right. You know, the, the modernists 70s. are very yeah. different from the postmodernists, and they're, they're, uh, there's a greater contrast between them. And as Christians, you kind of have to know who, which audience are you s speaking to. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Let's let's bring it into the sexual mm -hmm. category in terms of when we think of things uh, like transgenderism and just even sexual attraction and identity. How does this, so we, we've had a, a fairly philosophical conversation so far about just kind of truth and, and um, the, the divide of truth between even how uh, the secular world, as it were, is going to define a human versus a person, which really what we're getting at when we talk about this is we're saying, does the physical matter? Does the body matter? Um, is is does does our sexuality our sex male or female matter in terms of how we're born and then uh because of this divide as we think more about the postmodern approach to defining personhood um there there there's a great emphasis on separating gender from sex but how does the christian worldview help us define these things versus how the, the non-Christian worldview, the secularist worldview. So these are some of the things that I, I just threw a lot at you. Let's start with one. Let's, let's, talk, let's start with um, where and when do the ideas and conversation around gender identity become disassociated from biological sex? When, you know, what, when did that start and how, do, how are we beginning to see the manifestation, not even beginning, how are we seeing the manifestations of that in our, in our culture? Yes, I often start with transgenderism, actually, because one, if my argument in my book, Love Thy Body, is that the secular worldview denigrates the body, you know, does, does not value the body. Like you said a minute ago, it doesn't, the body doesn't matter. Right. Well, the most obvious example is transgenderism, mm -hmm. because transgender activists argue explicitly that your body is not part of your authentic self, right. you know, that your biological sense does not inform your identity. And uh, uh, there was a... A Princeton University professor who actually wrote a book on, on transgenderism. And her conclusion was, and this is a direct quote, the real, the real body, that's how she put it, the real body, meaning the physical body, tells us nothing. It has no meaning at all. Hmm. And I, I read that and I thought, you're telling people their body has no meaning at all. That it's, you know, it has no value, no significance. And you're not recognizing, you're not, they don't seem to recognize what they're really saying is, you know, your physical body, which is an important part of who we are, right. you know, that that's totally meaningless and that it has, it, it does not give you any moral message. It does not give you, you know, any information about your identity. Mm -hmm. Who so, you truly are is just who you are on the inside, right? In terms of, exactly. that's how you define yourself. Yep. Yes, and so, I mean, it does give Christians a wonderful opportunity to craft a positive argument then, yes. that the Christian ethic is based on valuing the body. The Christian ethic is based on saying, you know, who you are physically is part of who, you know, your authentic self, and it is important, and it is valuable. And here we are affirming, you know, affirming the body, affirming the physical reality in a way that, you know, historically people kind of thought, thought it was the opposite. They thought Christians didn't value this, this world, right. you know, that, that we're otherworldly, yeah. right? And that this world doesn't which, matter. Which to be fair is a fair, um, uh, you know, accusation in terms of, so I just think about how I grew up. I grew up being taught in the church that only three things last forever. God, his word, and the souls of men. Yeah. That's it. And so I was taught that and I love that. Uh, Certainly that's true. Yes, God, eternal, his word, eternal, souls of men, eternal. But what I wasn't taught is, um, well, God created us in a very physical reality with physical bodies, all of which, all of which, body, soul, mind, every bit of us is part of the imaging of God. Christ came in a physical body. 
He rose in a physical body. He now exists at the right hand of the Father in a physical body, and he's returning to a physical world to make it all new, to resurrect those who are his in physical bodies. And so, so much of the Christian eschatology even is centered around the physical nature of the reality of creation, both in the human body and all of physical creation. And I, I, you know, I don't want to, there's no one I'm thinking of when I say this, but I'm not thinking, man, so-and-so didn't teach me this, but just in general, I never heard that until much later in life. And when we begin to get that into our psyche and understanding of the Christian worldview, it really does give meaning and purpose and value to the body that the secular worldview doesn't, correct? Exactly. Uh, I think most people grow up thinking that Christianity says the goal of life is to go to heaven. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. To be a spiritual being in heaven. I, I visited my, I visited my uh, parents' church one day, and I have to tell you, he said, the pastor said three or four times, literally, during the sermon, things like, you know, we're so thankful to God that he saved us so we can go to heaven. You know, we're so thankful that Jesus forgives our sins so we can go to heaven. Right. It, everything was so we can go to heaven. Yeah, escape this physical world. Escape yeah. the physical world. Exactly. Right. And, you know, that's more Greek than it is biblical. I mean, mm. When uh, the, New, the New Testament church was born into an ancient Greek and Roman culture that did devalue the world um, for very different reasons than, than modern secularism does. But nonetheless, they had a low view of the physical world, and the C- Christians had to counter that. The early Christians faced some of the same issues we they really face. Did. Yeah. Because, uh, well, the Gnostics, a lot of us who've done Bible studies know that part of the New Testament is written against Gnosticism. And what did Gnosticism teach? It taught that this world has no value, it's, it's the realm of death, decay, and destruction. Yep. And in fact, it was uh, it was created by a low level deity. Gnosticism taught that there were several levels of deity, and this world was created by the lowest one, who was actually actually an evil god. Mm-hmm. You know, because this because the material world is evil and bad, uh, and so it was. Uh, and and Plato, uh, Platonism too. Uh, Plato has taught that this the body is the prison of the soul, mm-hmm. and the goal of salvation is to escape. Well. Christianity actually did not teach that because it said, no, it was a, it was a supreme God, not a low level God. It was a supreme God who created this world and it's therefore good. And as you just mentioned, and that's the same supreme God entered into the physical realm. Yep. So the incarnation was the ultimate affirmation of the dignity of the human body. And then when Jesus, uh, escaped, so to speak, <laughs> escaped the physical realm, what did he do then? He came back in a physical body, right? And to as to the ancient Greeks, this was not spiritual progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to come back to a physical prison? And right? that's what they actually argued. Mm. Yes, they did. They argued, mm. why would you want to come back to the realm of the body? Which is why Paul says in First Corinthians, uh, the very notion of a physical resurrection was utter foolishness to the Greeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was his phrase. Uh, and then at the end of time, right, we, we're so often taught that the goal is to go to heaven, and that's right. not the ultimate goal. Right. You know, the ultimate goal is the new heavens and the new earth, and right. you and I will walk on that new earth in new physical bodies. And just, just as real as the chairs we're sitting on and as f- real as this body is right now, it will be, be, the, it'll be that real, and, 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 but perfect. Right. And I, I was actually talking to someone who was a secular friend, and I said, you know, the Apostles' Creed affirms the resurrection of the body. Mm-hmm. And, of course, she was raised Christian, and she was like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, all the way back to the Apostles' Creed, Christians were affirming the mm-hmm. value of the body. Mm-hmm. And so we have, in a sense, lost touch with our own heritage. That's right. And we, we need to recover that, mm-hmm. that Because that heritage. helps us so much in the conversation with this, this whole issue of, of transgenderism and, and the belief that, okay, well, the body is mine to make it whatever I want to make it. The body is my, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's my canvas to shape as opposed to the Christian worldview. No, the, the body is not ours. The body is the Lord's. And we are to glorify him in it and honor him in the design that he gave us. Talk about though why, how can we help, how can we help people understand that what 
the Christian worldview offers in these ways is a better reality. It's a more, it's a more robust reality than what, what the world will tell you and the culture will tell you, no, this is, you know, it's for you to be the one that shapes your body is better than that. You know, talk about why this is a better offer that we're, that we're, that we're presenting. Yeah. Well, let me explain a little bit where it comes from. Um, It comes from the idea, ethics, ethics always comes from your view of nature because Mm. the body is part of nature. And so um, there's, there's a, a well-known public intellectual whose name is Camille Paglia, and she is a feminist and a lesbian. And she, she argues, yeah, on the one hand, she argues against the typical feminist view that sex is just a social construction. Mm. She said, no, no, no. Nature made us male and female. You know, humans are a sexually reproducing species. So then you say, well, uh, how does she then justify being a lesbian? And here's how she puts it. She wrote an essay in which she said, well, you know, nature made us male and female, but why not defy nature? Hmm. After all, and this is a direct quote, uh, fate, not God, has given us this flesh. We have absolute right to our body, absolute claim. We have absolute claim to our bodies and may do with them as we see fit. Mm-hmm. And so that's really where this is coming from. The, the logic is if our bodies are products of mindless material forces, purposeless forces, then they have no intrinsic purpose that we are morally obligated to, to respect. Uh, they give us no moral message. They give us no clue to our identity. So that's what's behind this negative view of the body. Mm. Uh, it's ultimately a, a Darwinian view of nature that says nature has no intrinsic purpose. And therefore, well, if that were true, then Camille Pagli is right. We sure. may do with it whatever we see fit. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's completely logical that if there was no, you know, if we are products of mindless, purposeless forces then our bodies have no intrinsic purpose or dignity. And they're just, they're just amoral mechanisms, you know, if you have a mechanistic view of nature. Right. Our bodies are just another mechanism, a cog in, a cog in the machine. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, how we treat them is our own business. So this is, this is helpful for helping people to realize where it's coming from. When Christians say, no, no, the core of the issue then is, are we the products of mindless, purposeless forces? Or... Are we the creation of a loving God mm. who intentionally created us, had a purpose for us, and therefore our bodies, you know, are bas- basically good. Right. And this, you know, this universe is good. Our bodies are good. And, you know, which is a very positive message. It gives right. Christians the opportunity to have a positive message instead of just saying, well, I disagree with this. It's wrong. It's against the Bible. It's a sin, <laughs> you know, which sure. is kind of what we're known for. Yep. Yep. We can have a positive message of, no, our message is this, this universe is good, your body is good, we want to value your body, your biological identity, we want to encourage people to live in harmony with their body, live in alignment with their mm-hmm. body, um, be self-integrated, you know, an integration between your mind and your right. body, your feelings. So it gives us the language to present a Christian ethic in a very positive way. And that Christian ethic speaks to a holistic view of self, correct? You know, where um, you would say what we get from how God has designed us is we get a view of self that's not only intrinsic, right? Where the secular world will want to say to us, just be true to yourself, right? That's the, that's the, that's the thing right now. Uh, be true to yourself. And whoever you decide you are, the world has to affirm you in that, right? That's the Trevin Wax. I quoted him in my sermon on Sunday, and he, that's kind of how he said it. He said, the, the great commandment now is um, love yourself, be true to yourself. And the, and the second is like it, affirm whatever someone decides to be. And, and with that, I don't want to be you know flippant or dismissive with that, but that is kind of what's at play here. But the Christian ethic or the Christian worldview would say, well, that's only looking inward at just the soul, if you will, just the, the, the inside of me to determine who I am. Well, the, the Bible actually says, no, let's look outward. Let's look to who God made us to be, who he is, and how we image him. And we begin to get a more holistic view of self that's not just the soul or whatever you want to call it, but it's the, the body, mind, and soul. It's all of who we are 
that gives meaning to who we are and it's all aligned and together right and and you you're, you're going to have better language than i am on on these kind of things but and 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 i think about all of that just to say this um what are and i'm thinking about our teenagers now for just a moment I'm thinking about this younger generation what what our young people now are being faced with is a narrative that is going to really preach to them that if you really want to be valued you get to decide who you are whereas what we are saying is if there's a god who's created us in his image then if we really want to know what true value is then he gets to say who we are right yeah i think what we have to help people see is that idea that i just look into myself um it so, represents a low view of the body. You know, that's, I keep mm-hmm, coming back mm-hmm. to it. To say that I should just ignore who I am physically and go strictly with my feelings, yep. what we need to help people is rec- recognize is that's an extremely disrespectful view of the body. Mm-hmm. There was a BBC documentary for teenagers, and it, it uh, featured a, non, a young woman who identified as non-binary, and she said... Um, she says, it, this, is, this is a quote. She said, it doesn't matter what meat skeleton you've been mm. born into. What matters is your feelings. You know, it's your feelings that count. And I'm like, wait, don't you recognize that you are just expressing an extremely low view of the, of the body? Right. Or um, another example uh, that I collected was, uh, that I give in the book, um, Love Thy Body, is a male-to-female transsexual named Jessica Savano. And she um, uh, was raising money on a Kickstarter page for a documentary of, of, of her life mm. that was to be titled, I Am Not My Body. Mm. And I thought, well, that sort of says it all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the secular view is saying, I am not my body. Mm-hmm. And it's being taught to very young children. Um, the Washington Post mm. recently um, had an article on sex education, and it quoted... Um, they quoted an actual curriculum that was f- where teachers of first graders, this was a first grade lesson mm. where teachers were told to say to the kids, you may have what some people call boy parts. Hmm. It doesn't even say just boy parts. What some people, what some may, people call may call yeah. boy parts. That doesn't mean you're a boy. And just because you have you know, parts that some people may call girl parts does not mean you're a girl. And so, and this was first graders. So kids down to kin- first grade, kindergarten are being taught, well, they're being estranged from their body. They're mm-hmm. being told, you know, your body tells you nothing. Mm-hmm. It was actually a, a, a news article. Um, the parents, it was in the news because the parents were taking the school to court because their first grade daughter had come home saying, Mommy, my teacher said just because you have girl parts doesn't mean you're a girl. So, like, what am I? Mm. And she literally said to her mother, please take me to a doctor so we can find out what I am. Mm. First grade, correct. First grade girl. Wow. wow. And, and it was in the news because they were taking the school to court for emotional distress. But our point, my point here is that um, kids don't take first grade are being you know, disassociated from their bodies. They're being told your body is re- irrelevant to who you are. You know, it's, it's insignificant. It's worthless. That's the underlying message. When somebody says, oh, what, you know, the only thing that matters is my feelings, we have to help them to recognize the broader point they're making is my body is not part of my authentic self. Right. And as Christians, our response is not just you're wrong it's sure whoa why would you have such a low view of the body why yeah. would you have such a demeaning view of the body nancy thanks for being with us we're going to pause right there at the end of episode one we're going to keep nancy with us and do a second episode because there's so much more that we can dig into and and really think about uh what how does feelings play into all this nancy's going to share some great stories with us and uh, then we're going to answer the really important question of as Christians, as the church, how can we engage in a compassionate way and love well in all this? So we'll, we'll do another episode. Stick around for that.